Good evening, Edgemont community. My name is Teresa Kaufman. I am the uh, Vice President of Parent Forums for the PTSA. I'm joined by Kyle Hosier, our principal, and Randy Silverman, who will be, thank you for joining us, Randy. She will be our guest speaker this evening on youth mental health. Uh, I will give you just a little bio on Randy. Randy is the founder and former executive director of the Youth Mental Health Project. Randy's personal mission to change the narrative around youth mental health came from over a decade of personal experience fighting to find help for her son, who was diagnosed with anxiety, depression, and early onset bipolar disorder as a young child. Randy has received multiple awards for her advocacy work including the 2016 NAMI New York State Media Award, the Laurel House 2017 Champion for Recovery Award, and, sorry, did I say that right? No, and the 2017 Mogan Shoe Public Awareness and Advocacy Award from the International Society of Bipolar Disorders. Welcome, Randy. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you, that was, uh, I, I don't know why I always get embarrassed when people talk about <laughs> <laughs> I'm just me. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. As as Teresa said, um, I'm a mom. I have three kids, and my journey in mental health advocacy started when my children were very young. My uh, my middle son, when he was seven, eight years old, started exhibiting signs of what I now know as anxiety. But I didn't know at the time that kids could have anxiety. I didn't understand anything about what mental health in children looked like, good and bad, and what I could be doing as a parent. Um, and so I, I be, went on a mission to, as I tried to discover how to help my child, and and we through all of the the stigma and the blame and the shame to really understand what this was and what I found, and this is really 15 years ago, that people just weren't talking about mental health. And so how do you, how do you get help for a problem that you don't know exists in the first place? And so uh, the Youth Mental Health Project was created as a nonprofit that could explore how to educate, empower, and support families and communities to better understand and then therefore care for the mental health of our young people. So um, that's a little bit about me. Uh, I, I thought I would start, and if you guys wanted um, to stay on with me, that would be great. Uh, and we can have a conversation. I am looking forward to answering questions and diving into conversation, but I thought I would start the first part of this conversation by giving you a, a little bit more information to, to talk about. So the, the topic of mental health is immense and nuanced. And I, I just wanna set expectations. We're not going to get through everything in an hour. <laughs> it's just literally impossible. So my goal in the conversation is to help with the narrative, help with conversations. A lot of the questions that I've already read and that I know are coming from parents who have, who have already written in and submitted questions are, are really, to be honest, about how can we communicate with our children? How can we talk to them so we can find out what's going on? And then how do we know what the warning signs are? And for those of you teens out there listening, you're wondering also, how, how do I know if this is, I'm just in a bad mood and that's the way it is? Or how do I know if this is really my parents' fault because they're annoying or it's really the school's fault? Um, and, and because it's not something we're taught and it's not part of our normal narrative. So I'd like to spend some time um, and I wanted to set expectations, just giving you new language and a new lens with which to look at the topic so that you could have better language to use to talk about it, both among your friends and among your family members. So with that, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna share my screen and, uh, and, and get going. Just, I have a few slides, I'm going to mostly be talking, but I thought it would be beneficial to go through some of these slides. I know sometimes that's boring, sometimes that's not. I'll do my best to keep it exciting. Um, 
So let's talk about, first of all, the facts as we know it. Half of all um, half of all mental health disorders emerge before the age of 14 years old. And in fact, one in five kids in our country struggle with a diagnosable mental health condition. That was one of those things I didn't know. I didn't know that a young child could struggle or to, could begin to struggle. I didn't know that actually mental health problems are more common than heart disease, lung disease, and cancer combined. And of course, the ne next fact is the worst. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in ages 10 to 24. And here's the thing. It's untreated mental health struggles have been, have been connected to and linked to suicide. But the good news is that early intervention and prevention can actually help and can make a difference. I was going to prepare a whole slide about COVID and mental health. I don't think I even need to explain that these facts are facts that were before COVID. And since COVID, things have gotten dramatically worse. I doubt I need to tell any of you listening that because you're feeling it. The kids are feeling it, our teens are feeling it, our young adults are feeling it, the isolation of COVID, the re-entry into the world, the, 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 the differences in, in learning and both virtually and in other ways. Our teachers are having a hard time and frankly, our parents are having a hard time. So I don't think I need to explain that things are dramatically worse than they were before these facts were out. So there are studies going on all the time to measure the impact of COVID. And we are going to see for a very long time mental health struggles that we can directly relate to COVID. But I wanted to point out that even prior to COVID, kids were struggling with their mental health. Um, and so we have to understand that this isn't a new problem. It, it's a more intense problem. But the silver lining, if there is any, is that we are more ready and more open to talking about it. And talking about it is key. So switching slides. Oh, wait, I did have a slide in there. Sorry about that, uh, about the effects of the pandemic. This is one study, um, which I'll just let you guys look at and read uh, while I continue to talk. So the problem we believe at the Youth Mental Health Project is that, as I said before, you can't get help for a problem you don't know exists. And our culture is, is very, let's say, parenting centric. And we're kind of taught as parents that it's our job to teach our children how to behave. And if they can't, or they're not doing something right, then we must be parenting the wrong way. And that, that cycle of blame and shame creates silence around the issue and makes us not want to talk about it. And, and for the young people who are listening, I have actually found that younger people are much more willing to and open to talking about mental health. They actually want to talk about mental health. And it's mostly the parents, that, no offense parents, but I'm one of you, that really don't know how to bring the topic up because we were not raised in a time where talking about mental health was something that we just naturally did. And so I wanna shift the conversation into um, understanding what mental health is. This is literally the definition of mental health. Mental health is, is something that, if mental health is, De is defined, sorry, excuse me. It's right here, I'm, I'm not reading. And so I'm thinking on the top of my head and then I got distracted when I started to read. It's actually a state of being, just like physical health is a state of being. When we think about our physical health, we don't automatically start thinking about illness or wellness. We know that health is a state of being that is anywhere between illness and wellness at, on any given day. Sometimes we're sick. Sometimes we have cancer. Sometimes we live with a chronic condition like asthma, allergies, diabetes. But when someone asks us how our physical health is, we don't automatically recoil 
and get nervous, we're going to start talking about illness. We realize there is a whole range of physical health. So it's really important to understand that mental health is the same way. Mental health, the term mental health, is actually describes the state of emotional, social, and psychological well-being, which affects the way a person thinks, feels, and behaves. And if any time we're going to have a, a discussion about mental health, all we think about is mental illness, um, then we shut down and don't want to talk about it. So what is really important to understand about this, and I think young people really do get this better than, than some of us old people, is that mental health is not binary. It's not about illness or wellness or diagnosis or disorder. There is an entire continuum of mental health, and we all have mental health, just like we all have physical health. And there's nothing to be ashamed of in talking about it, right? And, and so the, the, just that basic terminology, shifting the language to talking about mental health as what is your current state of mental health? How are you at this moment in time? As opposed to focusing on, well, I don't have mental health. You know, I, I don't have any problems. I don't have an illness. So I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to go there. We shift our perspective to talking about mental health as something we all have that's not binary. That enables us to open up the conversation a little bit better. So what do I mean by mental health is on a continuum? Well, I happen to have a mental health continuum right here. And you can take pictures of any of this, by the way, and all of this information is available on our website at the Youth Mental Health Project. But what I want to point out here is the continuum of mental health is anywhere from wellness to illness and anywhere in between. So what determines the state of someone's mental health? What determines whether you are in the red zone of illness versus in the orange or, or whether you're well? Well, there are a lot of factors, as you can see here, in terms of, and I, I, in terms of understanding what are some factors that are detrimental to your mental health, right, or that contribute to poor mental health. There are also factors that can help us improve and strengthen our mental health. Um, but the bottom line is that where you are on this continuum has to do with how you are functioning in life. So if you are functioning well in life, and I'm gonna get into this in a little more detail in a moment, then, then you consider yourself you know, on the well side. But if, if you're impaired and you're, you're not functioning well, that's when it's time to stop and ask yourself, do I perhaps need help? Do, is this a time to go to the doctor? Now, if we were talking about physical health, this would be the same. If I were in bed here and I had a fever and I couldn't leave the house, that would mean I'm impaired and so I'm ill. But if I'm not impaired and I'm healthy, then I'm well. And so if you replace physical health with mental health, it, it has, while the factors might be different, um, the idea is the same. And so what do I mean by life function? So there, we all have essentially three spheres of our life. We have our social life. We have either our academic or our work life. And then we have our own daily activities and self-care, um, taking a shower, for instance, or interacting at home with our family. And if anyone is impaired, if a person is impaired in any one of these spheres of life, that's a sign of concern. Um, it doesn't mean that, well, if you're not well, then you should be impaired in all of these places in your life. That's absolutely not true. A person can be severely impaired socially, for instance, and not be able to have friends and not have any kind of social life, not be able to be outside with other people. That's the significant impairment. Um, and yet they go to school and they do, you know, they get along with their family at home. Or some people really cannot handle school and cannot hold it together at school. But when they're home, they're fine. And the vice versa happens. 
a child can have a serious problem at home, but function fine at school. And so we have to make sure that when we're looking at how you're functioning in the world, that we're taking these spheres of life independently and evaluating them. A lot of times we think, well, if they're fine at home and but they're not fine at school, they must be, you know, they must be manipulating because they can control themselves here, but they can't control themselves there. And that's actually a myth. It's a false narrative um, because some mental health problems can be very isolating in terms of how they uh, how they show themselves, right? So that's an important thing to remember. So how can you tell, this is the big question people ask, how can I tell if this is just a phase or not? And there are a lot of questions that we've gotten that have been related to that, particularly among teenagers. I mean, being a teen in middle schooler to high school years is so hard. It's hard. Between just the regular teenage things that are happening and, you know, getting through high school and applying to colleges and hormone shifts and friendships. And then you add COVID to it. It's easy to feel like, well, of course my kid is sad and depressed, or of course they're anxious. That's all true. Right. Um, But how do you know when it's time to actually try to do something versus let it ride its course. The first thing I'm going to ask you is, if your child had a fever and could not get out of bed, would you just let it ride its course? Or if your child had a broken arm, or if you couldn't walk, you know, you hurt your leg and couldn't walk, would you say, well, I'll just sort of ignore it and see if it goes away? No, of course we wouldn't. Of course we wouldn't. And so I would like to suggest that anytime you're questioning if whether or not you're functioning, your friend is functioning well, your child, your parents are functioning, it might be time to talk about getting an evaluation, seeing, seeking some kind of professional help who can help you determine whether this is simply a moment in time or something that could last longer. So getting back to the slide, one of the things we want to look at is... <clears throat> to figure out, well, how do I know that this is typical versus something I should be concerned about? I talked before about impairment and I talked about the three spheres of life, but that's kind of, you know, vague. So there are three things you can look at when it comes to either your behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. Remember, mental health is a state of emotional, social, and psychological well-being that is impacted by our thoughts, feelings and emotions, right? And behaviors. So you want to look at the intent of those thoughts, feelings, or behaviors. How intense is it compared to what might seem, you know, a normal reaction? Um, People get sad. It's okay to be sad. Uh, There are a lot of things to be sad about or angry or irritable. Um, But how intense are those feelings compared to what it's about? And secondly, how frequently do those thoughts, feelings, and behaviors happen? Is it, you know, every day, twice a day? Is it, you know, once a week? Is it uh, every once in a while? How often does that happen? And then finally, duration. How long do these quote unquote periods or episodes or feelings or thoughts or behavior, how long does it last? So I'm gonna give you some examples. My son, who who you heard earlier, he started struggling with anxiety and depression. Anxiety when he was seven, depression when he was nine, and then was diagnosed with a mood disorder a little bit later on. And during our struggles, his symptoms would look like in terms of intensity, he would, if I, you know, handed him something that wasn't right. And I remember a specific incident, I handed him this fork, he didn't want that fork. He freaked out. He was 10. Okay. So he freaked out about this fork. I mean, it was a fork. It wasn't that big of a deal. That kind of thing used to happen a lot freaking out over if I said no to him, or I was trying to get him to go to school, or, um, you know, just the slightest misinterpretation of my tone. It would happen at the time he was really sick, probably multiple times a day. And it would last for hours and hours. 
So that's intensity, frequency, and duration. But above all else, think about how you're functioning in the world or how your child or teenager is functioning. Are, are you impaired? Are you feeling like you just can't move forward? Are you stuck? Is your child stuck? You can't get out of bed. You can't go to school. Everything seems hard. And how long does it last? How often does it last? And how intense is it? And when you put that together with functioning, that's how you can tease out, well, maybe this is not just a phase I'm going through. Maybe this is something more significant. And I would like to suggest keeping a journal of these things, right? We tend to forget, you know, days blur into days and, and, and all of a sudden it's Thanksgiving. And I don't even remember what last week was like. I just know that today doesn't feel good. And then you have a couple of good days, so you feel okay and you forget. So tracking those is really important, even if it's just a really quick journal. And it will help you or your, your parents or your people who you care about assess whether it's time to consider that this might be something to be concerned about. I wanted to throw in some signs of concern that were very a little more specific. Now, keep in mind, this is a very short list and, and the list of concerning behaviors is, is really long actually, because it can be a lot of, this is not the only thing. And also, you know, it, it doesn't have to be more than one of these things excessive worrying, avoiding friends, um, ailments, you know, headaches, always being in the nurse's office and you can't find a reason for it, change in sleeping or eating, you know, risky behaviors. Th these are your basic signs of concerns. And look, t I, I, everybody has moments like this. And I think part of the concern with COVID is that we think, well, it's caused by COVID. So once we get back to normal, everything will be okay. For some people, that might be true. For some people are going to come out of this experience with increased resiliency. Resiliency is the ability to adapt to difficult situations. And some people have that innate ability for a variety of reasons that are not really known, but some people will build better resiliency and some people will not. Some people will be triggered and it will be much harder for them to get through whatever type of mental health struggle that was triggered, either because of COVID or otherwise. So I'd really like to impress upon you not to assume that when things get back to normal, everything will be okay. Um, it may be true, but do you wanna take that risk? either for yourself or for your friend or someone else. And that gets back to the facts are that mental health problems are very common. It's the number one disability worldwide. Disability meaning you're impaired significantly by your mental health. It's the number one in the world. And, and those cases are increasing rapidly because of COVID. So I always recommend if you're concerned, why wait? Think about what you would do if you were concerned about a physical health condition. And I want to kind of final uh, have a final point in this, and 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 I could talk more about this. One thing that has been proven um, true is that early intervention works and prevention works. And one of the most important things is connection, human connection has been linked to stronger mental health. And so it's important that we connect with each other and which has been very, very hard during COVID. It's important that parents and teenagers and kids connect with each other. It's really important because those are the preventative factors. And for those teens out there who feel like, well, I can't connect with my parents, um, which is sad for me as a parent to think about, <laughs> but find another adult that you can connect with. Um, it's great to have friends and connect with friends, but if you are concerned about any of the things I've just talked about, find an adult to connect with. The fact that your school is having this conversation means that there are adults at your school who care, right? There are adults 
who are willing to talk to you about it. Um, I'm sure Kevin, could, I'm sorry, Kyle, excuse me, could speak more to what resources are available at your school. Um, but it's really important to connect at home because at the end of the day, if your parents don't get it, it's going to be harder for you to find the help that you need. And parents, empathy, right, is sometimes not trying to fix it, but acknowledging that things aren't okay and that it's okay if things aren't okay. It's okay. And really being truthful and honest with your kids about that and not and, and allowing them the space to feel what they need to feel. I don't know where Edgemont is in terms of social emotional learning. That's a big movement. We at the Youth Mental Health Project really believe that social and emotional learning is, is a path to strengthening mental health. And for those of you who don't know what that means, I'm going to really narrow it down to you know uh, social emotional learning for dummies, which is not that you're dumb, but just to simplify. Learning how to express our emotions learning how to be real with them and understand them so that we can identify what's going on, what's real, what's temporary versus what is unexplainable. And that's the other thing. Sometimes we can't explain our emotions, um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try and we shouldn't try to have the conversation. I wanted to let everybody know that for parents who are concerned about their kids' mental health, we have ongoing free support groups for parents. They, we have virtual support groups and we do have some um, support groups that meet in person depending on the location and COVID protocols. But there's no better help than another parent who has gone through the struggles and doesn't know how to help their kids. So I encourage you to, to look up our meeting calendar. We have multiple meetings every week for parents who are, and, and you, you, your child doesn't need to have a diagnosis. You just need to be concerned and then you can find support from other parents. I also wanted to put this up. I think these, these crisis text and hotlines are really important to have. I'm not suggesting anyone needs them, but it's good to have handy. There are places to call that are not your parents for crisis intervention. For There are great, you know, the, the text line is specifically for teens. And, and, and I just wanted to to make sure that everyone had this information. If you wanted to take a quick screenshot of that, that would be great. Um, so again, I, 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 I went through a lot of information very quickly. Uh, I, could, I told Teresa, I could talk about this topic for hours and, and I have actually, I've done what we call a mental health workshop 101, going through much more details than this in, in, in a six hour workshop. So there's a lot of information to learn. I'd like to also suggest that knowledge is power. The more you learn about mental health, the more you can A, talk about it and B, get the help that you need. Again, getting back to we can't get help for something we don't talk about and something we don't understand. And so, oh, I'm gonna share one more screen with you, which is, um, oops, that's not, oh, there you go. This is our website, or at least part of our website. And I wanted to point out that under the learn button, a lot of the information I just went through is here and we have free downloadable materials and resources. These booklets are really great. We've got Sorry, lots of facts. I'm not sure if we're looking at the right screen. Oh, okay. Let's see here. What are you seeing? Still the crisis slide? Yes. Oh, I see. Okay, so let me see if I can, let me see. Sorry about that. It's a, let me try to see how I can fix that. All right, I got it. Let me try it one more time. Thanks for your patience, I really appreciate it. Here we go, this is our website. <laughs> um, under the learn button, we have a lot of downloadable materials and fact sheets. And so I was just showing, and, and a lot of the stuff I talked about in terms of what is mental health is in there. These booklets here, which are free to download, are great conversation starters. So for those parents out there who are thinking, or teens even, how do I talk to my mom about this, dad about this? How do I talk to my teens about this? How about print out some of the stuff and sit down and say, let's talk about mental health. 
I mean, I know that sounds simple, but it really can be that simple. And if if your child or parent gets defensive, what, we don't have mental health in this house, <laughs> you know, say, actually, we do have mental health. Let me tell you what I learned about this fantastic event the other night that the, that the parents put on at, in the Edgemont School. We all have mental health and it's something we should talk about. You know, we learned, you know, for years, we've learned how to take care of our physical health, vitamins, exercise, nutrition, hand washing, but we haven't learned how to take care of our mental health as well as we need to. And it starts with being able to talk about it. So I highly recommend utilizing these resources. And there are many other amazing resources out there to bridge the conversation in the family and talk about, well, what do we feel about this? How do we feel about our own mental health? Um, what struggles have we personally gone through? And parents, model honesty. My kids know I have struggled with anxiety and depression. They know I've gone to therapy. I'm very open about it. I talk about it. Um, I did want to end also with saying I have three sons. I've told you that before. They are now 21, 25, and 28, and they're all doing really well. They struggle sometimes. My oldest son ended up um, being diagnosed with major depressive disorder after a traumatic experience being in an earthquake. Um, my younger son has, has ADHD and, and OCD. And, and I don't think we would have discovered that had my middle son not been so ill for a long time. That experience enabled us to learn about mental health and be open about it and open conversations will lead to the, the resources that you need and the help that you need. All right, with that, I'm going to stop my share and see if we can dig into questions. And I'm going to pull the three of you in into conversations. I, I Again, I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm gonna let you ask questions that you guys have gotten either from the parents or the kids in your community. And then maybe we can dive into a conversation uh, about it. So who's the lucky person who gets to ask me questions? I will ask the questions. Great. Um, I just wanted to interject and comment on the fact that parent, the students, um, teens were, if they can't speak to their parents, you recommended them speaking to any adult or another adult. And we found um, in our family that that really works, especially with the middle school years. Because oh, yeah. Sometimes parents are pariahs, become pariahs. Yeah. And just to have the neighbor that they can go and have a hot chocolate in their kitchen or something, any, anyone, a Zoom with the aunt that lives in California. Right. Anything. It's really, it really does make a difference. And I think it collectively is great for the family. You know, that I agree. And the child has so much. And I had that. So. Yeah. And I had that experience as well. I knew there was, that, you know, different each kid had a different person in their life they felt comfortable with. And, and, and I made a commitment not to ask, um, to let them have that privacy um, and right. conversation. And there were times when my friend or, or relative would share with me things that they thought were emergencies, but otherwise allowing your child to have a confidential relationship with someone else. Um, you know, as long as everyone agrees that if it's an emergency, if it's, life-threatening or, or self-harming anyone's in danger, that, then, you know, we, we have to open up a bigger dialogue. But um, I agree with you. And, you know, Kyle, I'm wondering if you could speak to, I don't know how your schools run, you know, look, mental health resources in schools are, we, who has the money for that, right? I mean, it's, it, 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 it's there, there, there aren't a lot. But what I do find is the if, if the guidance counselors, or maybe there's a school psych psychologist or counselor, at least as a first person to go to, you know, it, are there things like that in your school that, that are available or what would you recommend? Randy, I'm glad you asked that because I think we do have um, five counselors, two junior high, three high school who are very helpful. And for a school of just under a thousand students, we also have three psychologists, which is a wow. lot for student ratio. It is a lot, actually. And I would encourage parents, like if sometimes parents will call to say, I'm not sure if this is an issue, you know, who can I talk to? If you speak to one of our counselors or psychologists, sometimes you can just have a conversation with them. 
and get ideas, it doesn't then need to turn into a conversation with the child unless that's what the parent wants. So just right. brainstorm ideas to get a sense of what it looks like from a counselor or a psychologist having that added perspective and just right. trying to get more ideas to help because we know it can be stressful at home for parents. Yeah. I think that's a, a resource that we encourage parents to use. That's fantastic. Um, I wanna add to that uh, for parents listening, be honest with them. So. Um, a lot of times we're embarrassed or we're worried our kids will get labeled um, or that if they get a diagnosis, they'll be labeled forever. Having a diagnosis doesn't mean that you have an illness. Having an illness is when you're impaired. Having a diagnosis means you have a, a condition that you have to deal with, right? Um, so take the stigma away from that and, and the shame of, of that away. Um, but more importantly, the school can't help you if you don't tell them the truth, right? If you're, if you're hiding um, some important information that would actually help the teachers and benefit the educators to be able to assist your child, then you're not helping your child. Um, and, and I highly, highly encourage it to be as open and honest as possible. Um, People, parents get mad at the school a lot, and then the schools get mad at the parents, and there's this disconnect between the parents and the schools because, you know, we're defensive, all of us, right? It's not our fault. It's not our fault. Well, the truth is, it's nobody's fault, and we just all have to work together to figure out how to solve and manage um, and so that our kids can learn because it's very difficult to learn if you have an emotional or mental health problem. It does impact your education and your child's education. So you're not doing anybody any favors by hiding. And that's true for the teenagers too out there. If, if people don't know, if adults in your life don't know you're struggling, um, who, who's benefiting from that? Nobody. Um, and nobody can help you if, you, if, if, you don't, if you're not honest. So I, I, I highly recommend all of that. Honesty, super important. <laughs> Sorry, I got off track. Um, so, Teresa, um, go. I'm going Thank to ask you. you a question. Okay. Um, one of the questions is, my kids tell me they're fine, but I'm never really sure. They mostly seem okay, but I worry, especially with the teenage mood swings. Is there a better or another way to assess or ask? Great question. Great question. Um, yeah, kids, I, I, I'm fine. I'm fine. Oh, that's just so hard to hear as a parent. And let me just tell you, both kids and parents, parents worry. They might not look like they're worried, but 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 we worry. Parenting is is like it's just a minefield of worry and and blame and guilt. That's just what we do, right? So it's normal as a parent a to worry. Um, back to the conversation, how do we get more than fine? And, and there are a lot of great books about, you know, how to talk to your kids so they'll listen. In fact, I think that's the title of a book, <laughs> um, how to talk to your kids so they will listen or talk back um, to you. Asking open-ended questions as opposed to, how are you today? Or how was school? Um, you know, asking, asking something a little more like, so um, what are you learning in algebra? Or What's the, 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 tell me something funny that happened today. Tell me a story about a teacher, you know, something and to try to engage in a conversation. It's really hard. I don't know if you've heard of these things called table topics where you can take out and it will ask oh, right. a question and get, yeah. you know, use right. tools like that to, to engage in conversations. Um, in terms of specifically about mental health, um, as a parent, when we don't know, we can look for certain signs. Are they, are they um, some of the signs we talked about before? Sleeping too much, well, that's hard because teenagers you know, need a lot of sleep. So that's, not, that's a hard one, but are they able to get up and go to school and interact at school? Are they able to function in an educational setting? Do they have friends? Are they engaging in activities that they used to like? Or do they still like those? Are they starting to withdraw? Are they starting, you know, look for, for subtle signs um, and trust that if they say they're okay and they're going to school and they have friends and they're just moody, you know, they're moody is different than 
being enraged to the point of throwing a chair in, in the wall, right? So again, looking back to intensity, frequency, and duration. Yeah, we're all moody these days. And, and teenagers have a lot of right to be moody right now. But again, looking back to intensity, frequency, and duration of how, how what does that moodiness really look like? How extreme is it? And then talk to them about mental health. So use the language that I've just suggested and mentioned. Pull out some facts. You say, I'm really interested in this whole mental health thing. You know, what do you think? What are you seeing about the other? I know you're fine. I know you're fine. But what else are you seeing, right? Try, try to find, you know, I can't help it. I worry you hear it in the news. So I'm not, you know, I'm just curious. What, what do you find? How are your friends? Because it's all in the news these days. And it is right? We're all talking about it. We're all talking about mental health. Right. So try to use it as a dinner conversation in a way that's not about them, right? In a way that's much more neutral conversation. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised at, um, at how much you might get out of them if you just let them talk not about themselves. So th those would be some of a handful of recommendations. Great back door. That's a great way to get around, uh, around it. Okay. Another question. How can we help, uh, I guess, how can we help children feel good about themselves and more confident when they have low self-esteem? Oof. That's a really hard one. Let's go back to, I'm not a psychologist. Let's go back to that. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I was, no, I was going to say, I, <laughs> no, no, I said, let's go back to the fact that I'm not a psychologist, but I can tell you from my experience, right? Um, kids have to have highs and highs and lows. I don't mean moods, highs and lows, you know, good things happen and bad things happen. Um, and we can't always tell them they're wonderful and perfect because then they know we're lying. Right. And we tend to prop our kids up so much that they don't even believe us anymore. So, you know, part of it is again, getting back to being, you know, r real. And I don't mean, you know, mean, you know, but, you know, get giving input when it's, you know, when it's being asked for about how a kid is doing. Now, I know that sounds great, but if you're talking about a kid who already has, you know, low self-esteem, you certainly don't want to add to it. I would say radical acceptance, which is just something I just said. I don't know if that's a, that's a term for something specific, but it's accepting, you know, Johnny, you are who you are and, and I love you no matter what. And I accept you and other people will too. Uh, and you, you know, you don't have to do things perfectly. You can, I think we, we don't know how much we crit, critique our kids. So I'm saying two different things. I critique them, but I also think over critiquing can be hard. If your child is already feeling bad about something like getting a bad grade, it doesn't help to tell them they should study harder right? Mm -hmm. Or well, if you studied harder, you'd feel better. Well, that's not helpful. You know, again, back to empathy, real empathy is just being there with a person. Like, yeah, that, that sucks, you know, right? Or that's, that's hard, um, as opposed to figuring out how to fix it. I don't know if self esteem is a, is a hard one. Um, and do you guys have any suggestions for self esteem? That's, a, that's, you know, and, and it, it Kyle, you look like I you think, want to say I something. I think it's tough. It's definitely. It's tough. You know what? And, and relating. When I was a kid, I didn't believe in myself either. Right? I think it's, that is a, nor, a lot of kids act also like, like they, how, like social media is such a good example, right? Like everything's fine and they're on top of the world, but they're really not. And reassuring your child, look, we all have doubts about ourselves. We, we do. And when you're younger, you tend to have more doubts. And frankly, with everything going on in the world and with social media, where everyone seems perfect and happy and having a great life, if you don't feel like you are, that just makes things worse. And so, oh, social media is an entire conversation. I know I shouldn't even bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a whole whole workshop on social right. media. Right. I'm not anti-social media. I just think that, you know, we have to learn how to use it in a way that builds our who we are and doesn't tear us down. So that's all I'll say about social media. <laughs> so this is interesting. You might have touched on this in your uh, in the beginning. How do you offer suggestions to an anxious child without them perceiving it as criticism? You talked about this with I accept you. 
And I yeah. Know no matter what. So anxiety um, is the most common mental health disorder in, in, in kids and teens, but I mean, in people, right? Anxiety. And there are a lot of kinds of di different kinds of anxiety. Um, but the good news is it's the most treatable. There are really good treatments for anxiety. I'm not suggesting, oh, well, if your kid has anxiety, you know, haul them off to a psychologist. It depends on how much the anxiety is interfering. But what I'm saying is, there are tools that kids can learn to cope with their anxiety. Um, there's a gr great treatment. I think the best treatment for anxiety is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is essentially a type of ther therapy that teaches tools, breathing techniques, distraction techniques, um, self-awareness techniques, you know, feeling your body and learning to recognize the signs that you're going to start feeling anxious and how to combat that. And so um, even mild anxiety can benefit from cognitive behavioral therapy, just like, you know, you'll, you might go to doctors um, for, for things that aren't that serious, but you're going to, to get stronger. You, physical therapy is, is a good example to strengthen your muscles. Well, cognitive behavioral therapy is something that can strengthen your mental health if you tend to have anxiety. And for parents, I would suggest do some reading on cognitive behavioral therapy and kids' anxiety. There's a lot to learn, and you can learn techniques to teach them. Um, if they're teenagers and they don't want to listen to you, you can slide the books, you know, under their door. <laughs> so here are some great techniques. I'm not criticizing you. The brain is the most complicated organ we have, and it affects everything we do. It's, it's, my brain is making me do this with my hands. My brain also impacts the way I think, feel, and behave. And sometimes it doesn't work right, and that's okay. And there are things we can do. So some people have real experiences that cause them to be anxious, traumatic events, um, or you know, even just everything with COVID. But sometimes there's not a real reason that someone might have anxiety. There's, there's a we science is just behind. We have not done enough research on the brain and why we have the the mental health struggles that we have, and so. Some people can struggle with anxiety, depression, or a multitude of other mental health disorders for no apparent reason, and it's nobody's fault. And so approaching it like that, look, this isn't your fault. It, it wouldn't be your fault if you, you know, if, if you got cancer, right? We wouldn't blame the person for having cancer. Um, we wouldn't say, well, just get better. Or if you had asthma and you're having an asthma attack, we don't say, well, breathe better. <laughs> if they could breathe better, they wouldn't have asthma, right? So telling a child to relax, for instance, when they're feeling anxious, if they could relax, they wouldn't be anxious, right? If they could do it, they would do it. They don't know how. Um, and so, you know, approaching, helping them in that way and thinking about it as you would asthma or allergies or diabetes, something like that, uh, that will, will change everything really. So I hope that's helpful. It's very helpful. Um, I think we have time for one, maybe one or two more questions. Uh, sure. In that same, it, this goes with what you just said. What do you do when the child does not want to talk to their therapist anymore or a mm. therapist? So what um, do you do? find a new therapist. <laughs> so <laughs> seriously, uh, if you can't make someone go to therapy, even a child, um, I, I mean, I did, it didn't, it was a waste of money because, you know, sometimes if, if, the, if it's a child just isn't going to engage with it at all, it, it's not going to work, um, regardless of what kind of therapy it is, right? If you're in cognitive behavioral therapy where you're just learning skills, it's not the same as talk therapy, the old fashioned sit on the couch um, and talk about your childhood, but, but real, you know, learning skills. If the child doesn't want to learn them, that you know, and doesn't want to engage with it, then it's it's not going to matter. So, find out why. Does the child want to feel better? You know, you talk to your to to your son or daughter. Do you or do you want to feel better? If you don't like this therapist, let's find another one. Um, connection 
is really important. And if your teenager is just not connecting, um, then maybe there's someone else out there who they would connect with. In the past, what I've done with my kids is I'll interview a few therapists, either just even by the phone or Zoom. And now Zoom, it's great. You can really do it. And I'll tell my kid, you, you interview them. I want you to pick the one you like. I narrow it down to the three I will think will be okay or that accept insurance or that I'm willing to pay for or whatever, and then give them a choice so that they feel they have agency over, uh, you know, whether they're going, you know, how they're going to interact with the therapist. Um, now, if your child is really not functioning, I don't mean to say, well, don't bother if they don't want to go. You have to do what you can do to get them there. You, you, if if you are really concerned, um, again, find ways, other ways. But I, and again, like I said, obviously this therapist isn't working for you. So let's try something else. Not every therapist is the same. Two therapists teaching cognitive behavioral therapy could go about it in completely different ways. And there's an element of connection and trust. And so if the connection and trust isn't there, it's nobody's fault, then time to move on to someone else where there will be connection and trust. Now, that's my recommendation. Okay, he, the next question says, what advice do you have for parents of children who feel like they have to get an A or they failed? We have tried to let our child know it's okay to get a B in class, but the culture of competition tells him otherwise, resulting in a lot of anxiety. Oh, that is so hard. And, and we do live in such a competitive culture. I actually raised my kids in Westchester, uh, New York, so, so in Armonk. So I know all about, you know, the culture of competition. You know, it's interesting. Each child is different. Um, my older son did not care about grades. Uh, he was really smart and he got good grades. And I would say, if you just studied a little harder, you could get A's. He's like, ah, do I really need to? Because to be honest, um, I, I, you know, I'm fine with the way it is. And I was like, oh, well, you'll get into better college. And he's like, I'll get into where I'll get into. And um, that's the son whose apartment I'm in. He actually just snuck in and he's gonna be embarrassed to, for me to say that, but he's now in grad school at Harvard. So my youngest son, right, who can say, right, but he didn't care when he was younger. My younger son is a perfectionist and has to get an A on everything. And it was maddening because I had the opposite problem of trying to get him to slow down. You don't have to get an A on, on everything. He's the child that turned out that he actually had OCD. And I didn't really recognize this. I mean, I recognized it earlier because I already knew something about anxiety. I'd done a lot of research and reading. OCD is an anxiety-related disorder. And he went to cognitive behavioral therapy and it really helped him a lot, sort of manage his own self-expectations. He is a senior in college. And he, the first thing he did when he went to college is he found himself a therapist who he sees every week, who he has seen since he's been there every single week to help him manage his own expectations about perfectionism. He doesn't have the germ washing OCD um, or the tapping or any of the things that we think of as OCD. And so it, it wasn't recognized. So um, we, we can only do so much as parents, right? We can't make them study and be, you know, and well, some parents think you can, but I, I think that our children are born who they're born and their brains function the way they function. And you can have three children who are completely different. And so, you know, what works for one child isn't going to work for another child. Um, but if it's coming from your child that they feel this stress, then, and, and you say to them, I don't care if you get a B or a C, you know, relax. They can't help that. They can't help that they're so stressed out about it. So then the question is, what can we do? Because the anxiety and stress you're experiencing um, is, is bad, you, is, is, is having a negative impact on your mental health. And so I don't want you to feel that kind of pain. What can we do then? To, to help with that anxiety you're having? Would you like to consider um, trying to learn some coping mechanisms? In fact, I just heard about this great thing called cognitive behavioral therapy. Maybe we could find someone who could help you with that. So 
again, treating it the same way you would treat physical health and, and engaging in the conversation and engaging the child and participating in their own self-care, right? It, 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 it's really important to get them on board with their own strengthening and care of their own mental health because they are going to have it for the rest of their lives right? Their mental health and their physical health. We teach them about exercise. We teach them about eating and vitamins. And so we have to acknowledge that we have to allow them space for caring for their own mental health. We can't do that for them all the time. We can lead them in a certain direction, um, but we have to get them involved in the choices, particularly once they hit adolescence and teenage years. Um, So uh, the last question that we have quickly, if we have a minute, is um, about okay. sleep and academics or sleep sleep and academic performance. Mm. Uh, you did touch on this a little bit, but just mornings are, uh, are extremely irritable in the mornings when trying to get him to school is an all out war. Oh, uh, I saw that. I saw that question. So uh, I, I think sleep patterns um, can be an indication poor sleep patterns can be an indication of an impending mental health problem. They can be, not always, but they can be. Um, And so, uh, and of course, the less you sleep, uh, you know, the the, the more irritable you're going to be. So of course we think, well, they're irritable because they didn't get enough sleep. Um, And so let's fix the sleep. Well, yes, you can try that for sure. Trying to regulate sleep. And there are lots of things you can read about, you know, turning screens off after a certain time and night and, you know, what you're eating right before bed and getting into a routine. I mean, there are lots of things you can read on how to try to improve sleep patterns. Sleep is really, really important. Um, But if, if the, sometimes a kid sleeps a lot, it gets, you know, I think the recommended um, sleep for a teenager is nine, I don't know, it's probably eight or nine hours. It's probably 10 hours. I don't know what it is. But if they're getting the recommended, I'm not a sleep expert, a recommended amount of sleep, and they're still waking up irritable and a battle going to school, there's something called school refusal. It's an actual term uh, that means that that a child is is so anxious or depressed or having such a struggle with their mental health that getting to school is paralyzing. My son actually struggled with very severe school school avoidance. They might call it school avoidance now, school avoidance, school refusal. Every single day was a massive battle. And some days I couldn't get him there. I, I you know, and, and it was a problem. And I had to actually get help it's from the up. Oh, I guess let's say the car, help from the special education department to try to figure out how to, you know, combat the school refusal. And that was actually one of the first signs of, of him starting to, to not be well. And I didn't know what it was. So we tried consequences. We tried, you know, bribery. We tried, we tried everything. And in that particular instance with my son, it was severe, severe anxiety that was getting in his way. And I didn't know that. So I didn't know how to get him treatment for anxiety. I didn't know, you know, that that could lead to serious depression, which it did and led to very serious suicidal thoughts. Mm. Um, All because school made him anxious or he, I shouldn't say made him. He had a lot of anxiety around going to school. Um, And so instead of getting him into treatment, you know, he had he- headaches, stomach aches, he was tired, he was this, he was that. I had him going to doctors for two years to try to figure out what all of these other problems were when really it was anxiety the whole time. And so try to stop and think to yourself, okay, well, what is this battle about? May, is it just sleep? If it's sleep, we've got to fix your sleep routine, right? And if the sleep routine, fixing the sleep routine doesn't help, um, then consider what else might be getting in the way of being at school. And then do they eventually go every day um, or, or are there times when you just can't get in there? Is it impacting their learning? Is it impacting how they are when they're at school? And that you won't know unless you talk to the teachers. 
Um, for my son, it got to the point where he, you know, he, he'd go to school for an hour and end up in the nurse's office. Um, and so it significantly impacted his ability to learn because he couldn't get himself to class. So again, back to intensity, frequency, duration. Not being able to go to school every once in a while happens to everybody. And I would advocate, sorry, Kyle, for mental health days in school, you know, just like sick days. Everyone, everyone should get like one mental health day a semester. That's my opinion. Sorry, just my, <laughs> my parent opinion. Um, so mental health days, that, that happens, right? But if it's consistent and it's impacting your child's ability to, to really get there and learn, um, then, you know, consider something else. Now, one more thing. If it's just they're fighting with you every morning and then everything else in their life is fine, then you might want to think of different strategies. And there's a little, there are a lot of things you can read out there about different strategies. Parents who are moody, and I can tell you this as someone who has a child who has bipolar disorder, um, sometimes need to be parented differently and approached differently in a way that doesn't always feel normal or natural. Um, that's not your fault as a parent. It, it, it's just, we have to learn different skills and uh, how to interact with, with, you know, humans that are more moody than we are, for instance. So anyway. Randy, thank you so much for this hour. This very You're welcome. Very, very informative. Kyle, You're welcome. You have any Questions or any anything? I, I just want to say thank you to the PTSA for bringing Randy to us to have this important conversation tonight. And want to encourage parents again, and for any students who are listening, please reach out to counselor, psychologist, to a teacher that you have a relationship with um, to start a dialogue. If if you are thinking that maybe a little help could be um in order or just to start the conversation and again for parents if you call it we don't have to then report it to students it can be anonymous just to get a conversation started so please consider that if you have some concerns uh with your that's children. great and don't forget knowledge is power you can teach yourself a lot of stuff there's a, there are a lot of good resources out there and so you know don't hesitate to get in touch with us at the youth mental health project um, maybe when you put it on the YouTube channel, you can put our email and our website information. Um, and there are a lot of great resources out there. And sometimes it's hard to, to wade through them all. And, and one of our goals at the Youth Mental Health Project, as I said, is education and support and helping families kind of wade through all of the information that's out there. So most importantly, talk about it, be open, be honest, and, and keep this conversation going. This is an hour is a short conversation but keep it going in your community. I thank you so much, the, P, the PTA or PTSA? PTSA, uh, PTSA and, and, and uh, Mr. Hoosier for having me and for bringing this conversation about don't let it end here. Uh, an hour is just not enough. <laughs> right. We do appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a start. It's something, yeah. right? Okay, <laughs> thank you.